Lauren Lewis, and tonight we are going to be talking about holistic health from a women's perspective. Then when we when you came in, and then I can turn back around and feel comfortable again. <laughs> Lord have mercy. I knew it's just those geeks would not act right. <laughs> well, so happy to have all of you here today. You got to give them some room. You got to give them some room. You got to give them some room. Uh, okay, when you knock him in the mouth, because we got some movement going. Oh, Lord, she said, yeah, right. <laughs> now, the exciting thing about this class is that we have been trying to more or less share with you information that we've accumulated over the years. Now, this information, I hope, for, I hope that it has been beneficial. But I got a question for you. I'm going to take out something out of my wallet right now. I'm going to take something out of my wallet right now. No, don't take too many. My wife just walked in here. Um, what is this? It's a hundred dollar bill. What is the value of this bill? I would declare to you that this is worth nothing. This is worth nothing. If I gave this to Cheryl, and she decides, I am a physician. I don't care where you put it, I can get it. <laughs> that bill, if I gave it to Cheryl, is worth nothing unless what? She uses it. She uses it. If she takes this bill and just keeps it in her pocket, what value is it? Nothing. Nothing. You have been given some valuable information over these last seven weeks. You can put it in your pocket. You can set it on a shelf. You can hoard it. You can do anything else with it. But if you don't what? What value is it? Nothing. Now I can talk to you every time I come here Tuesday talk about my ice cream how I love to eat my ice cream every day. But if I kept on continuing eating that ice cream, what value is that me coming in here telling you about my, my problem? If I want to lose weight and I've been given the tools and I don't use it, what value is it? Dr. Wright came in last week and he was talking about the infectious disease and the most important thing was to what? Wash your hands. Now if you don't wash your hands and you always coming down with colds because every time you touch a, a chair, every time you touch a doorknob and then you touch your nose and you're sick and you're, I, uh, I've been around them kids too long. It ain't them kids, it's you. The information is only as valuable as you use it. So as I said to you, I am not preaching to you. I am preaching to me. Because I too am not exempt from information. Back in the 30s, it was known that physicians would go from patients to patients without washing their hands. And what they were doing was spreading disease from one patient to the other. Information, valuable. So folks, I'm not asking you to drink arsenic or cyanide or anything like that. <laughs> what I'm asking you to do is follow biblical principles. Now, we said, who created us? So he wrote the manual on us. So if he knows how to take care of us, where should we be reading about how to take care of us? His word. So now if it was my word that I was telling you, then you would be suspect. So what I'm trying to do is just encourage you. Don't take this and put it on a shelf. Okay? 
I know some of you are having a difficult time trying to get motivated and get moving. You know, T. Davis came here last week and just he tried to motivate you and just, you know, Ebony talked about motivation, motivation, motivation. See, if we lived by ourselves and we were by ourselves, it would be a difficult world to live in. But God created us to where we are social beings. We interact with each other. So therefore, you got to call a friend. Hey, I'm going walking today. She might say, no, I don't want to go. No, you're getting out of there. Let's go. We're going walking. We promise each other we're going walking. Amen. Okay? So that's what this is about. Now, tonight, I want to introduce you to um, some ideas about brain exercise. Mm. And we're going to watch a video, and that's why you need some room. Um, it has been known that there's a process called neuroplasticity where the brain continues to learn as long as you are alive. Amen. And that is true. Because you can be 90 years old and you see somebody new, you will know, and you know, they introduce themselves, you will know them. Amen. The brain can receive that information. The problem is we don't continue to use our brains because what we do is we become creatures of habit. Uh -huh. And so we just continue to use the same small pathways. Yeah. So the rest of the brain continues to shut down because we're not using them. So tonight we're gonna go, we're gonna talk about how we can use our brains to continue the process of the brain learning. Okay, neuroplasticity, all right? And the title of this is Ageless Grace. So we got a problems when it was tapping your foot because that was new learning process for the brain. So the brain was actually doing a new process trying to learn that new function. So what you're doing is you're actually increasing the use of your brain over a period of time. And they've shown that people in their 70s, 80s, 90s can continue to learn. And so therefore, the mind continues to process. So there are about 21 of these exercises in this called Ageless Grace. And, you know, we will try to develop more of those. What I'm, what I'm trying to do is to get somebody certified to actually come into the church and then we can actually be part of that program. Because what it's, what it's shown to, to do is that if over a period of time you continue to stimulate the brain, the actual effects of dementia decreases. So not only are you physically staying in shape, but you're mentally staying in shape, okay? So that's what this process was all about. How many of you, how many of you felt pretty good when you're doing it? And there you were in the chair doing a lot of these different things in the chair. And you were getting a workout in the chair. And it wasn't no jumping jacks and all that other stuff. And you all were, uh, uh, woo. <laughs> but your brain was doing that. Think about it. You st don't you feel a little stimulated in the brain? It's like, yes. oh, what's going on up there? <laughs> New processes. New processes. So. You can do that while watching TV, right? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> you can use different, different music as well. And you don't have to have the cat in the background. <laughs> <laughs> like, like Wycliffe said, you know, really, it, it, when we went through medical school, they would tell us that, especially since we're bringing on our, our um, next um, physician here this evening, that when we rotated through OBGYN, they're saying that whenever a woman became pregnant, if she had a cat, kill the cat. <laughs> <laughs> And the reason why is because cats have so many diseases that can affect the pregnant woman. You know, and we thought it was kind of cruel, but it's like between the baby and the cat, the cat got to go, okay? <laughs> our, our next presenter. Uh, are you going to introduce my uh, assistant? Oh, Lydia. Yeah. <laughs> I will at the end. I will at the end. I promise. I, I have a special guest with me here this evening. My sister's here. Uh, my other um, younger sister, Lydia, and Lydia and I are, um, Lydia is one of those who has a very kindred spirit. Amen. And she's one of those in our family that when we need something spiritually done, we call on Lydia. Amen. 
Lydia was that mild-mannered one. Now, the rest of us, you don't call us for being mild-mannered anything. You call us when you're ready to fight, okay? <laughs> but I'm glad to have my sister here. Lydia, will you give everybody a wave? I don't realize my classmate. <laughs> We're so happy um, that our next presenter um, is a member here. Uh, I've known her even before she existed. All right. Um, but she's a well-qualified, uh, well-trained physician. And she's here tonight to talk about uh, women's health. Can you give her a, a welcome round of applause, Dr. Lauren Lewis? Yes. All right, awesome. So. Is that okay? So I am Lauren Lewis, and today we are going to be talking about um, living healthy, kind of holistically. So primarily, this talk is focused on women because I am a women's health physician. However, um, a lot of stuff, especially in the beginning, can be used for both genders. Um, I'm very like laid back, so if there are questions, stop me. Ask me if I'm talking too fast, tell me to slow down, because I do that sometimes as well, okay? All right, so we're just gonna go ahead and dive right in, and sometimes some of what we talk about may be a little bit of a repeat, um, but hey, we're just making sure we make those connections in our brain, repetition, okay? So generally, when we think about like healthy living or holistic living, the primary, th the primary thing that people think about is a healthy body. So people are usually talking about diet and exercise. That's usually kind of the first thing that comes to mind. So even though that is important, our bodies, um, good health is more than just about our physical. Uh-oh, come on back now. Hold on, all right. Good health is more about more than just our physical bodies. So our minds and our bodies are very interconnected and they have significant effects on each other. So just for example, so say you have a whole lot of stress and you are depressed. If that progresses for a long time, that can actually manifest as physical symptoms. And then in contrast, if you have physical symptoms for a very long time, it results in increased stress and in depression. So, um, because we know about this interconnectedness for kind of whole body wellness, it's important to kind of have a balance between your mind, your body, and your spirit. And we need to make sure that we are nurturing our whole self. So that includes our physical needs, our emotional needs, our mental needs, and our spiritual needs. So because I'm a physician and that is what I was trained in, the first thing we're gonna talk about and the majority of what we're gonna talk about is our physical body. So when we're talking about a healthy body, the first thing that you usually are gonna think of, again, are gonna be diet and exercise. But our healthy bodies are more than just that. So even though diet and exercise is important, if we're gonna talk about optimizing our physical health, the discussion should be about diet, it should be about exercise, and it should also be about appropriate screening. So coming in um, and getting the testing that we need done in the appropriate time. So um, the first thing we're gonna talk about is kind of a healthy body. So because I'm an OBGYN, our governing body is called ACOG. And so what they talk about in terms of a healthy body is fitness. And our goals for fitness are to maintain appropriate weight, to make sure we consume a healthy diet, and to make sure that we are all participating in some kind of regular physical activity. So why do I care about my weight? So most of us kind of instinctually know that we wanna maintain an appropriate weight and that it's beneficial, but do we really know why? So it looks like you all have been learning over the past few weeks about some of the benefits of keeping an appropriate weight. So I'm sure we've all seen, is this a pointer? Okay, so I'm sure we've all seen this or some kind of variation of this before. So this is the body mass index chart. And so what it does is it takes our height, it takes our weight, it puts them together and it kind of tells us where we are in terms of our weight. So are we underweight, are we a normal weight? Um, are we obese? And then we have different classes of kind of morbid um, obesity. So studies have shown though that there are benefits 
um, to keeping our correct weight. And if we're not in our optimal weight, by losing weight, we've shown that it can lower our blood pressure, that it can lower our cholesterol if people have cholesterol issues, and that it can um, result in improved blood trigger control for people who have diabetes and other kind of um, insulin insensitivity. In addition to that, if we are at our optimal weight, we found that weight loss has been proven to do some other beneficial things. So it decreases the risk of heart disease, it decreases our risk of infertility, it decreases our risk of osteoarthritis, and it also decreases our cancer risk. So in terms of women specifically, it decreases their risk of breast cancer, colon cancer, and uterine cancer. So they found that in obese women, they are five times more likely to get uterine cancer than women who are of normal weight. So of all of these things on here, which one do you think is the most common cause of death in women? It is heart disease, and that is the most preventable um, or modifiable disease up there. All right, so when we're talking about our weight management, the goal is gonna be caloric balance, right? So if you are trying to maintain your weight, you need to consume about the equal amount that you expend, right? If you are trying to lose weight, which I'm trying to do, then you need to consume fewer calories than you expend. And if you're trying to gain weight, then you need to consume more calories than you expend. So that seems really simple, but why is it so hard? So it seems like every time I'm in clinic, I hear my patients saying, when I was younger, I could eat whatever I had to eat. I didn't have to do no exercise and I never gained none, no weight at all. And something happened after 30. Well, do you know what? Studies show that something really did happen after 30. So if you look right here, this is the caloric um, requirements that we have in women based on age. And if you look between the ages of 19 to 30 and 31 to 50, that caloric requirement decreases. So what happens is, as a woman ages, her metabolism slows down. If her caloric requirements decrease, and if she doesn't change her eating habits and, and change her exercise habits, she's gonna gain weight. And the same is true for men. So, kind of uh, the cornerstone of um, health is a balanced diet. So we know, we've learned, we do New Start, um, and we know that eating a nutritious, balanced diet is gonna be essential for achieving and maintaining kind of a healthy weight. So we know that we should enjoy kind of a variety of healthful foods from all of our food groups. So that's gonna be whole grains, fruits, vegetables, healthy fats, but despite that, even though we know this, and even though we know that there are a variety of nutritious foods available, that is not what Americans do. So, Americans, even though we have a plethora of food available to us, we do not eat the array of foods that we need to eat to stay within our caloric requirements. And, so the foods that we eat are not nutrient dense, they're usually lower. We eat the nutrient dense foods, we eat less of that. So we don't eat the green vegetables and we don't eat the whole grains, but we eat more of the nutrient lacking foods. So we'll have, I like ice cream too. So we'll have some ice cream. My issue is this right here, pop. That's my, that's my problem. So we'll do ice cream, we'll do pop, we'll do sweet tea because sometimes it tastes better. That's just real life. Donuts. And donuts, all of that. And so that is what gets us in the situation that we're in right now. So what things should we eat? So does anybody remember this table? So this was the old school food pyramid that they have for us growing up. Um, the US, they came up with this. They thought that it was gonna help us to get a healthier diet. But the, th the problem with this is it's kind of hard to understand. So they put, so they, they made it seem like this is better than this stuff and you should eat more of this than the rest of this. And they really didn't tell you how much. So they told you a serving, but you really don't know how much a serving really is. And so it didn't really do a lot of help. So 
In 2011, they decided to change it up to try and make it easier for everyone. So actually, this was part of uh, Michelle Obama's initiative to make it easier for people to be able to look and see exactly what they needed to eat. So instead of the pyramid, which is a little more difficult, what we have now is my plate. So the interesting thing or the easier thing about my plate is when you look at it, you can see off the bat that half of what you're eating should be fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. So they made it that way and they put it in those bright colors so that it would stand out and that it wouldn't be hard for people to understand. And then the other two um, portions should be grains um, and proteins. So in terms of exactly what they wanted, they didn't do the whole serving size thing anymore. They told you exactly how much of it they wanted you to eat. So in terms of um, fruits, they feel like you should have two cups of that. And then they give you examples of which different fruits you can use to make that requirement. Vegetables, they want you to do two and a half cups of vegetables, and they want you to do a variety of different types of vegetables. In terms of grains, so the old food pyramid, they just showed all the grains together, like everything is equal. Well, we know now that we want to choose whole grains um, ahead of our kind of more processed grains. So like whole wheat um, foods, breads, and tortillas. In terms of um, dairy, so before they're like, hey, Dairy, we want it, all of it, doesn't matter. But now they're telling us that if you're going to do any dairy, it should be low fat dairy. So they're not saying they want you to do like whole milk. They're saying, hey, 1%, 2% skim milk. Um, and then proteins, they're saying a variety. So it used to be, hey, we just want you to do meats. Um, but now they're giving you meats and then they're also telling you what that um, bean and legume equivalent is. So these are the things they want us to be eating. So these are recommendations that are specifically for women. So we know that it's more difficult for women to get things like um, vitamin D, and we know that calcium is gonna be really important to keep our bones strong and to keep our bone mineral density up. So the recommendation is that we should be, if we're not doing, with it, with doing it with our diet, which is very difficult for us to do as Americans, then we should have some type of supplementation of vitamin D and, and calcium to make sure we keep our bones strong. Um, other things that they want to make sure that we get a lot of are going to be things like iron, particularly in women who are of childbearing age. So in times past, they just wanted to talk about the heme iron that's coming from um, animals. However, they also include if you're getting um, iron from plant-based sources, but they recommend if you're going to do it from a plant-based source that you want to add some kind of citrus so that you can help um, absorb that in your body. Other things that they want you to make sure you get some of are folic acid. And that's, again, primarily for um, people who are of childbearing age and are trying to um, expand their family because we know that folic acid um, is helpful for the development of the neural tube, the spine in the baby, and deficiency um, causes neural tube defects. So that's why we begin fortifying cereals and breads and things like that with folic acid. Alrighty. Things that they want us to stay away from. Sodium, we want to stay away from that. And they're telling us that we want to stay away from things like saturated fat. So they want us to have less than 10% of the calories that we eat to be from um, saturated fats. And we want to replace them with kind of monounsaturated um, fats. So, exercise. Physical activity. So studies have shown that actually physical inactivity is a major health problem worldwide and it overall it is becoming more prevalent. Our current medical literature um, that we have shows that physical activity is gonna be associated with some significant poor health outcomes. And when they looked, they found that one in every five adults is physically inactive and that that is most prevalent in developed countries like the US. It is more prominent among women and it is also more prominent among older adults. So in addition to just not doing exercise, we've also increased the percentage of time that we've spent doing sedentary behavior. So that's things like on the TV, on the computer, 
on our cell phone, all of that has been increasing. And so when they looked at this, they've done studies and the study suggests that if you decrease your um, physical activity and increase your sedentary activity, it results in increased risk of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and all cause mortality. So just dying from anything. So sitting at home and just watching TV or playing on my phone and not moving increases my risk of death. That is insane to me. They actually did a study um, recently um, at Brigham Women's, which is the women's hospital that's associated with Harvard. And when they looked, they showed that a lack of exercise and physical activity causes as many deaths per year as smoking. Mm. Wow. Wow. Smoking, and that study came out in 2017, November, this past November. So, we've talked about what happens if we don't exercise, but why should we, right? So there have been multiple studies that show the favorable impacts of exercise on our organ systems and just in general, um, health outcomes. So it decreases our causes of death from everything. It decreases our risk of cardiovascular disease. It decreases our risk of cardiovascular death. It improves our glycemic control and it improves our cognitive function. So in times past, they were looking at studies with like older adults with like Alzheimer's and other types of dementia, but they've actually shown that there is improved cognitive function in younger adults and in older adults. It reduces your stress and anxiety. It decreases depression. And it also provides some moderate protection against different kinds of cancers. So for women, we're talking about breast cancer, endometrial cancer, and for everyone, pancreatic cancer, intestinal cancer, and then for men specifically, it decreases your risk of prostate cancer. So what kinds of exercises should I be doing? <laughs> So, um, as a result of these benefits that we've seen, ACOG is recommending that all women, all adult women, engage in some type of regular physical activity. Um, so there are generally two different types of exercise that we talk about. So there's aerobic exercise and there are muscle strengthening exercises. So aerobic exercises are gonna be the exercises where you're moving large muscles in kind of a rhythmic fashion over a prolonged period of time. So that's things like running, brisk walking, swimming, and then my personal favorite, oh man, come on now. <laughs> You gotta do my favorite. Okay, and my personal favorite, which is dancing. So um, when they looked and they say, well, how much is too much? What helps, what doesn't help? When they looked, they saw that moderate intensity um, aerobic activity for two and a half hours per week or vigorous intensity aer aerobic activity for an hour and 15 minutes um, per week is beneficial. So things that they would consider like modern intensity activity would be things like brisk walking or those exercises that we were just doing in the chair. And then more vigorous um, intensity activity would be things like running and jogging. Um, but, so I don't want y'all to go out and think, oh, I just gotta go run and walk for two and a half hours right now. No. So what they want you to do is kind of spread that throughout the week. So you don't have to do it in one sitting. They want you to spread it out throughout the week in at least 10 minutes in each session. Um, in terms of getting more substantial health benefits, they want you to do it a little bit longer. So five hours of moderate intensity activity per week or two and a half hours of vigorous activity per week. And again, they don't want you to go and walk five hours in one sitting, they want you to break it up. But when they do that, they again see the decreased risk of the colon cancer, breast cancer, heart disease, um, diabetes, and it decreases your risk of unhealthy weight gain. They want you to spread it. So they generally say if you spread it over like three days or so, um, it decreases your risk of injury and fatigue. So sometimes when you go hard every day, by like day two, you're kind of over it and you're not trying to do it anymore. So give yourself some space so that you can keep going. Um, in terms of the muscle strengthening exercises, these are exercises that are 
focused on overloading your muscles so they can increase your bone strength and maintain your, mu your muscle um, mass. So these are gonna be things that work like your legs, your hips, your back, abdomen, shoulders, those individual um, groups. And things, or e examples rather, of these muscle strengthening exercises would be things like weight training, um, calisthenics using kind of um, resistance bands and then heavy gardening so if it includes like hoeing digging raking all that um, uh, mowing. yeah mowing also all of that is associated is considered like a muscle strengthening exercise and what they recommend for the muscle strengthening is doing that at least two days per week at least two to three sets of eight to 12 reps. So if you're gonna go to the gym and you're gonna do like, I don't know, some chest press or something like that, you wanna do between eight to 12 of those and you wanna give yourself a break and then do it again two or three times. So whatever it is that you're gonna pick, you wanna make sure you pick something that you like, right? Because if you don't like it, you're not gonna keep doing it. So, and you may think, oh, well, I don't want to join a gym. I don't want to spend this money. Can I do something that I'm going to enjoy that may not cost $5 billion? Well, yes, you have many options. I don't know if you can see all of that up there, but there is fishing, there is swimming, there is golfing. Where's uh, golfing? I don't know where he is. There you go. There's golfing. There's rowing. There's also jogging. There are a million different things. Shuffleboard, tennis, volleyball. All of those things are considered significant physical activity and those um, they increase your good health. Oh yeah, skateboarding. All of that. Soccer. So the last part in terms of a healthy body, like we talked about, so it's not just diet and exercise, it is appropriate screening. So it's good to have a good diet and it is wonderful to exercise, but it is important for you to make sure you know what screenings are recommended and that you come in at the appropriate time. I have seen too many cases of preventable cancer just because people hadn't been in years, like years. And a lot of these gynae kind of cancers, specifically things like cervical cancer, like if we catch that early enough, you, it's a day procedure and you can go on about your business. Um, so it's just really important that we make sure we come in for the screenings appropriately um, and follow up appropriately. Yes, ma'am. So that's, see, here we well, go. Well, every two, two to three years. So here we go. <laughs> because this is the most confusing thing um, that I get. So one of the most confusing things that, that patients come to me with is about cervical cancer screening. Because a lot of times people don't really know what we're doing when we're doing a pap smear and they assume that any speculum exam is a pap smear. So what a pap smear is doing, we are getting cells to look for your risk of cervical cancer. So the current recommendations, and it's hard to follow because it changed from when I was a student to when I was in residency and then to when I was done practicing. So it's changed three times in 10 years, over 10 years. So these are what the current recommendations are. So first, yes ma'am. I have a question. Why is there no testing after 65? What about seniors? So here we go. So um, the current recommendation is if you are under 21, you don't need a pap smear at all. So the reason why these um, recommendations change is because of what we learned about cervical cancer. So cervical cancer is caused by infection with the HPV vaccine vaccine, mercy, the HPV virus, okay? So the reason why we decreased the screening window and change it from, so it used to be 18 or three years after whenever you first started having sex. Then it was 21 or three years after whenever it was you first started having sex. But what we learned is this virus is very transient younger people have better immune systems so they can fight it off 
easier. So what was happening is they were doing a plethora of procedures on these younger women for things that their bodies would have fought off anyway. So those things like leap procedures, comb procedures, they increased their risk for things like preterm labor, preterm delivery, cervical incompetence. So because we know now that they would have been able to fight it off on their own, we don't do it anymore. So um, for people who are between the ages of 21 and 30, we're doing a pap smear by itself once every three years. Again, for the same reason, because one, the HPV virus takes a long time to start changing the cells. So it takes one to two years to start changing the cells anyway, and it takes one to two years for the cells to go back to normal. So that's why if it was normal three years ago, then you have time. So it takes a very long time for it to become cervical cancer, 10 plus years. And for young people, because their immune systems are better, by the time they come back, they've been able to fight it off and they don't have those changes anymore. For people who are between the ages of 30 and 65, the recommendation is for a pap smear and HPV testing at the same time. Because if we know you don't have HPV when we do your exam, then we know that you can't be getting cervical cancer right now. The likelihood is very low. If you get it between the time we saw you to the time we see you again in five years, it's not enough time for it to progress to cervical cancer. Does that make sense? And then for women who are over the age of 65, the primary reason why they stopped testing um, is because the, their life expectantly, expectantly, mercy, I can't talk today. Their life expectancy is less. So by the time it caused the problem, they're gonna be dead. So they don't, so they don't do it anymore. No, I mean, that's, that's, that's the reason. That's the reason, and, and, and also, hold on, pause, pause. In addition to that, in addition, so we feel like older women usually have matured more, so they are more selective. So they are, they're better about safe sex practices and careful partner selection. So, Cervical cancer is an STD, essentially. That's the only way that you can get it, essentially. So women who are older aren't making those same choices that would have caused them to be infected in the first place. That makes sense? Just out of curiosity, what was that life expectancy? Uh-oh. Was it 75 years? What? No, 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 no. So like 65, so you're 65, your pap smear is normal, right? and you don't have HPV, right? You would have seen, you are a wiser woman. So I, I'm making the assumption. You, so the likelihood that you will, I don't even know how to say this without saying it. The likelihood that you're just gonna be out here wilding and running through the streets to get infected is very low. Yeah. Yes. What was that life expectancy number they were talking about? Was it 20 years now? Oh, 20 years from here? From 65. Yeah. From 65. Because even with, even with the breast cancer screening, they stopped that at 75. All of it. It's for the same reason. So by the time it causes an issue, the life expectancy is not, they expect them to either be not alive anymore or too old to care. That's, that's, I mean, that's really why they stopped it. I'm not, not even a joke. Exactly. It's three score and 10. That's appropriate. Praise the Lord. I'm sorry. I think she was first. So, I'm in Clarksville. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So when was her last screening? I, I don't know. I didn't get all of that. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, been so I had a, a I had a lady. <laughs> <laughs> so, so not that. 
not necessarily out there, but she may not have gotten appropriate screening. So I've had three, three times since I've been in Nashville, three separate cases of women who had stage three and four cervical cancer because they hadn't seen anybody in 30 years. They hadn't been doing anything else. They, 30 years, hadn't seen anybody. And I saw them both in the ER. I didn't even have to do an exam. I just walked by the door and I was like, this lady has cancer. I, I, you, don't even, you don't even have to do an exam. And it's, not, and it's not that, oh, she developed cervical cancer later. No, she has had this for a very long time. <coughs> she just was not coming in and getting her screenings appropriately so we couldn't catch it in time. Um, do, 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 do. <coughs> yes. Yes, so the HPV testing is done at the exact same time now. So you use the same vial. And so we send it, they're able to test the pap smear, they're able to look at the cells, see if they look abnormal, and they're able to look for DNA of um, the HPV virus. So there are different types of HPV viruses. There are low-grade viruses, and then there are more high-grade viruses. So the low-grade viruses are the things that cause like genital warts, and the high-grade viruses, strains rather, are the ones that cause cervical cancer. So now we've gotten very specific and we can look specifically for the types of HPV that cause cervical cancer. So we know that the most common types that do are 16 and 18, so we look for those every single time and then we look for all the rest of the high-risk types also. Um, something that I didn't put on here, if you have had a hysterectomy, a total hysterectomy, meaning you don't have a cervix and you don't have a uterus, you do not ever need another pap smear ever again because you don't have a cervix that can cause cervical cancer. Now mind you, all of this um, is based on if you've never had abnormal cytology in the past. So if you've never had an abnormal pap in the past, if you have had some kind of abnormal cytology in the past, you are going to keep on having screening until it's been at least 20 years after whenever your last abnormal screening was. So say she was 65 and her pap was abnormal and she thinking she done. No ma'am, 85. And then say she comes back at 85 and it's still abnormal. No ma'am, 105. Like it's just gonna keep on going. 20 years. 20 years until it's normal. All right. So, whew. the next thing we're gonna talk about is breast cancer screening and some things you, I'm sure you've heard of before and some things may be a little bit new. So, in terms of breast cancer screening, the things that we definitely recommend um, are gonna be a clinical breast exam every one to three years for everybody who's between the ages of 25 and 39. And then after that, we recommend clinical breast exams annually from 40 on. So that means you're coming to the doctor and you're having a health professional do a breast exam to see if they feel something abnormal. In addition, the recommendation is for screening mammography. So we're looking with the mammogram generally every year starting at 40. Um, some people you know, they don't want to come back. So you can say, hey, you can do it every one or two years. But ideally, it is every year. The thing that's a little bit different is self-breast exams. So remember when everybody was talking about self-breast exams and they had the little thing that you hang on the shower and they had the months out and how you needed to do it every single month at the same time every month. So we don't recommend that anymore. Um, what was happening was people were feeling, thinking they were feeling all kinds of things and they were coming in getting unnecessary biopsies and excisions and all this kind of stuff. So what we recommend instead is something that we call self-breast awareness. So we're not saying that every month you need to do an exam, but you need to know what feels normal for you so that if at any time there is something that's abnormal, you can come to the doctor and let us do an exam. Okay. 
Um, another thing that we don't talk a whole lot about is gonna be bone density screening. And so what that is, it's kind of a low dose x-ray and it's looking at different areas in your body like the hip, hand, or foot. And we're looking for evidence of like bone thinning. So looking for your risk of things like osteoporosis and osteopenia. So in terms of people um, who we say should be screened, so everybody who is 65 and older, we feel like they should be screened. If you are younger than 65, but you're postmenopausal, you should be screened if you have risk factors. So those would be things like um, if you have a low body mass or low body weight, if you've had a previous fracture in the past, if you're on um, any kind of like high risk uh, medication, we want you to be screened. All right, so we talked about healthy body. And now we're gonna briefly talk about um, healthy mind. So our beginning activity that we did today was kind of a caveat into exactly what we were um, gonna talk about. So they've actually done studies and they found that if you engage in any type of intellectually stimulating activity, like you said, it um, is linked to reducing your risk of developing Alzheimer disease. So this kind of mental stimulation, these mental stimulation activities can be um, passive or they can be more active. So in terms of passive things, that can be things like listening to music, um, and then more active things would be like puzzles, um, games, learning a language, doing math, learning dances, line dances, all that. Oh, we're gonna get there. <laughs> um, another thing in terms of a healthy mind that we don't always uh, take care of in our community is kind of like emotional stability. So in our culture, in the African American uh, community, and kind of in the um, religious community and the spiritual community, we need to kind of destigmatize kind of mental illness and emotional trauma. So sometimes we feel like the Lord will deal with it. He will. Mm -hmm. However, he has also provided us with health, mental health professionals that can help us to deal with it. So we need to kind of talk through these negative feelings and these um, experiences so that we can live our best lives. And then, you know, something that we definitely know about healthy spirits. So I didn't need to get real deep into it because we at church, so we know. Um, but there is actually a very large volume of research that shows that people who are more religious have better mental health. Um, it shows that they adapt more quickly when they have health problems compared to those people who are less religious and that for whatever reason, these benefits have impacts on their physical health. So it decreases their risk of actually acquiring disease and um, it has effects on their response to treatment. To do things to make sure that we are keeping our spirits healthy. So we have to build our relationship with the Lord through regular devotion, prayer, acts of service so that we can allow the Lord to manifest all of the fruits of the spirit. <laughs> Aeons. Let's see if it works. So this is, is it gonna, oh man, hold on. Wait a minute. Wait. Wait a minute. Hmm. How do I do it? So this is my personal. Wah, it's not working. Wait, let me, I'm trying, well, wait a minute. I don't know if we can do that now. So this is, if I can pull it up. So this is both a physical activity and a mental stimulating activity because I am learning. Oh, you know what? All right. Yay. I'm telling you, I'm gonna be the most excited one, but that's okay. So, this is actually my old line dance stomping ground in Chicago. Huh? No, it's a G. It's work it out.
Oh, I'm not in the one I'm in. You can't put on here. <laughs> yeah, you can't put that one on there. All right. I was the most excited, but that's all right. So that's line dancing, everyone. And that is all. You are welcome. Questions, comments, concerns, complaints? All right. Well, you all have a wonderful evening. Thanks, guys. Let's give Dr. Lewis another round of applause, everybody. If you could bring in information that was like yesterday, I mean, you know, I was giving you information from years gone back, and she just giving you the new stuff right out. You know, so that's why it's important that we have different people that bring to you information, and, and they were just excellent. I mean, because some of the questions, you know, I'm confused about a lot of the stuff that was going on as far as doing a lot of the screening, and so. Therefore, she, she made it plain. She made it plain. Um, I guess we're going to turn it over to um, Cheryl. We have a, um, I guess I could give a quiz real quick. Wasn't that so educational? All I gotta do is wait till I'm 65. <laughs> right.